1912, German chemist Anton Kolisch synthesized MDMA, 3,4-methylene-dioxy-methylamphetamine, while working for the German pharmaceutical company Merck. Kolisch was trying to develop a vasoconstrictor to stop bleeding when he accidentally discovered MDMA, which he first called methylsafrolamine. Merck patented the drug for potential pharmaceutical use, but it was shelved when no legitimate pharmaceutical use was found at the time of its patenting in 1914, though it's rumored that the drug was sold as a diet pill, although never marketed. Kolisch would enlist in the German army at the outbreak of World War I and die in combat on the Western Front in 1916. On Christmas Eve in 1912, Merck filed two patent applications that described both the synthesis and chemical properties of MDMA and its conversion to methylhydrastinine. Researchers at Merck would continue to study the compound as a potential pharmaceutical over the next few years after a patent was approved in 1914. In 1920, shortly after the death of MDMA's creator, Dr. Anton Kolisch, during World War I, Merck patented a chemical modification to MDMA. In 1927, MDMA was studied by Max Oberlin, who was looking to study the effects of substances similar to epinephrine or adrenaline and ephedrine, a structural analog of methylamphetamine and MDMA. Oberlin found that it had similar effects on vascular smooth muscle tissue, stronger effects at the uterus, and no local effect at the eye. Oberlin concluded that the effects of MDMA were not limited to the sympathetic nervous system. Research was stopped, in part, due to the rising price of safrolmethylamine, a chemical used as an intermediate in methylhydrastinine synthesis. In 1952, Albert Van Schoor performed toxicological tests with MDMA while conducting research on new circulatory stimulants. Between its first mention in the literature in 1912 and 1953, MDMA was mostly overlooked as a pharmaceutical agent of its own, usually being mentioned as a chemical side product involved in the synthesis of other compounds. Although there exists a rumor that MDMA was sold as a diet drug in Germany around the 1910s, there is no evidence to support that it was ever marked as such. MDA, a chemically close cousin that's a metabolite of MDMA, was however being patented and tested by Smith Klein French as an appetite suppressant in humans around the year 1958, though it was abandoned due to its psychoactivity. After Merck concluded that MDMA had no marketable pharmaceutical application, they placed it in their archives where it was largely forgotten until its patent had run out and its existence was discovered by the United States after World War II. In 1952, researchers at the University of Ann Arbor in Michigan began a large-scale study into the effects of what was then referred to as psychomimetic drugs, which would eventually be renamed psychedelic drugs by British psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond in 1956 in a letter to Aldous Huxley. The Ann Arbor study included marijuana, LSD, mescaline, psilocybin, and a then little-known compound called MDMA, which was determined by Merck to have possible mind-altering properties in a 1951 review of the drug, prompting researchers to include it in their Ann Arbor study the following year. Though it would not be known until years later, the study at Ann Arbor was actually part of the top-secret government project called Project MKUltra that was devised by the CIA. MKUltra's inception came out of the CIA's quest to find new special interrogation techniques in the 1940s, which would see them exploring areas such as mind control. The first of these was given the code name Project Bluebird, and later Operation Artichoke, though these two programs were not very successful. These programs eventually led to a project designated MKUltra, which sought to investigate psychoactive drugs which might have use in warfare and espionage. 
Beginning in the early 1950s, the U.S. Army begins its investigations into MDA and MDMA as possible interrogation tools, with officials designating the compounds EA-1298 and EA-1475, respectively. After the study at the University of Ann Arbor, there was another drug study by doctors working under contract of the U.S. Army at the New York State Psychiatric Institute, which unfortunately resulted in the death of tennis professional Howard Blower, who died after receiving an injection of MDA supplied by Edgewood Arsenal, the headquarters of the Army Chemical Corps, as it was not known the chemical identity nor toxicity of the substances given to participants. Besides the University of Ann Arbor and the New York Psychiatric Institute, MKUltra utilized a wide range of universities, hospitals, jails, and military bases to test psychoactive drugs on often unwitting participants. According to James Thomas Hall, one of the founding members of the 13th Floor Elevators, this included the University of Texas in Austin during the early 1960s. Tommy, who had originally enrolled in UT in 1962 as a chemical engineering major, had changed his major to psychology and was interested in studying the effects of psychedelic drugs on the mind. Seeing an advertisement for a study conducted on campus that appealed to him, he quickly volunteered as a subject, which would result in the researchers giving Tommy LSD for the first time and studying his behavior while tripping in a controlled setting. Although he found the experience of being under observation, pricked and prodded like a lab rat, annoying, it began Tommy's lifelong obsession with LSD and other psychedelic compounds, such as mescaline, DMT, and psilocybin, though there is not much evidence that he or the elevators took MDA, MDMA, or other analogs. Studies at universities across America continued in secrecy, with the general public unaware of the CIA's influence or purposes, with the project largely focused on LSD, but also other compounds, including MDMA. Although MDMA was one of the lesser-used drugs during the government's Project MKUltra studies, it was used. This resulted in MDMA leaking from the covert operation into the wider society and American drug culture. Author Ken Kesey, who wrote The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and led his group, the Merry Pranksters, in their psychedelic bus across America, along with the group's later acid tests, was one of the many notable individuals who took notice to MDMA. Kesey was so enamored by MDMA that he attempted to smuggle a small supply for personal use from the government's MKUltra project after participating in a study. In 1967, American chemist Alexander T. Shulgin, who had initially worked for Dow Chemical, where he developed the first biodegradable insecticide, Zectran, before devoting his study to developing novel psychedelic compounds, attended a conference on ethnopharmacology held at the medical school in San Francisco, near blocks away from Haight-Ashbury. The conference was called the Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs, and was the first time that most figures in the area were assembled together in one place. One of Shulgin's acquaintances, a young professor of chemistry named Noel Chestnut, introduced him to one of his graduate students named Marie Kleinman. Kleinman told Shulgin about an experiment she conducted with two close friends of hers, where they bioassayed 100 milligrams of MDMA, a chemical which Shulgin was not experienced with. Revealing the emotional experience to Shulgin, he grew interested enough to self-experiment also. Shulgin had synthesized MDMA before, in 1965 at Dow, but neither he nor anyone he knew had tried it until now. Shulgin went and promptly resynthesized the compound, finding it unlike anything he had taken before, though noting that it was not psychedelic in the visual or interpretive sense, but the lightness and warmth of the psychedelic was present and quite remarkable. Shulgin would be responsible for introducing the drug to his friend, Leo Zeff, a psychiatrist who found that the drug had great psychotherapeutic potential. 
Zeff and other psychotherapists used the drug throughout the 1970s, though it also began making its way on the street as a recreational drug. But it wouldn't be until a Dallas man first tried the compound and fell in love with it enough to spread its message that the real birth of ecstasy would begin. In 1976, the Boston group formed a group that compromised of a chemist, advocates of spiritual development, and psychotherapy, and members of the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab. Born on the south side of Chicago, Michael Clegg would become a Catholic seminary student at the age of 12, studying Spanish, theology, psychology, and tennis. But in 1965, Clegg decides that his life wasn't cut for the priesthood and turned his attention to sales. He built a security systems company after reading about the new technology in motion-detected alarms that automatically called the authorities. Clegg paid a night watch captain with the LAPD to discreetly hand over local burglary reports in the LA area to help his business. When a home would be burglarized in Los Angeles, Clegg's staff would call them the following day after. In 1968, he sold his business for $3.2 million, spending the next few years spending most of it away, drinking and partying. During this time, Clegg had several business ventures including a mercury mine in Nevada, imported microwaves from Japan, and resorts in Texas and Mexico. During the mid-1970s, Clegg taught yoga and tennis as an instructor at an upscale residential area in North Dallas. His customers, which comprised of middle-aged, affluent housewives, found Clegg's charming photo in an ad in the Yellow Pages offering Zen tennis therapy. Clegg traveled back and forth between his condo in Dallas and a yoga resort in Mexico until the late 70s when Clegg had his first life-changing experience with MDMA in California, after being introduced to it by a friend. Having a religious epiphany on the Mexican beach, he vowed to become its prophet. Clegg had originally learned to make MDMA in order to secure himself a steady supply after his first experience, taking his brother-in-law to the remote mountains region in Northern California to begin learning how to manufacture the compound. The duo would live in a house in the remote mountains and use the location as their base of operations. Clegg's original plan, going to California, was to track down Alexander Shulgin, who rediscovered the compound in 1967, but Clegg was unsuccessful. He still managed to get the recipe from someone else, and soon the ecstasy operation was up and running. At the time, the primary source of the drug came via a single group of underground medicinal chemists in Boston, Massachusetts, who primarily provided the compound to the psychotherapeutic community. Clegg had other plans for the drug, and wanted to produce his own MDMA to supply those who sought the powerful experience outside of the psychological community. In 1981, Clegg christened the compound with the name Ecstasy, soon putting together a business plan. Initially, he gave out the drug for free at parties hosted at his Dallas condo, but could only do that for so long. When he could no longer afford to hand out the drug for free, he would create a company and ecstasy manufacturing operation. Initially, Clegg called his product Adam, but felt the name Ecstasy was more marketable and fitting. Michael Clegg was not the first to come up with this idea. Beginning in 1976, a group known as the Boston Group, which comprised of a chemist, individuals interested in spiritual development and psychotherapy, and members of the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab, began synthesizing and distributing MDMA to acquaintances and select individuals in the Boston area. The Boston Group hoped to spread MDMA, which they believed was a powerful therapeutic agent. They supplied some psychotherapists with the drug to use in their practice, including Rick Ingrazi, a physician and early MDMA psychotherapist. Still, they were a small periodic manufacturing and distribution company, and Clegg had his eyes set on a large-scale operation. In 1981, with a little startup money from friends, Clegg founded the Texas Group, which would become a for-profit venture in 1983. 
In 1983, Clay created his group, naming it the Texas Group, in honor of the Boston area inspiration. Clegg's startup money came from some friends of his who were brought on as Texas investors after being convinced to fund Clegg's manufacturing and distribution company. Buying a home in the mountains of Northern California, Clegg started manufacturing tablets with his brother-in-law in his California lab before shipping his product to Texas, where it quickly made its way into Dallas area nightclubs and the party scene. Clegg also supplied other Texas cities, such as Austin, Houston, and San Antonio. In addition to their California lab, the Texas group had another Texas lab for manufacturing ecstasy and hoped to keep up demand. The Texas group served as the ecstasy distribution hub for the Southwest, while the Boston group continued their operation up north. The Boston group had adopted Clegg's moniker, ecstasy, to refer to their product themselves. Clegg had originally coined the name in 1981, after he had initially fallen in love with the compound when he tried it in 1978. According to Clegg, the experience was like hearing Moses on the mountain, and he wanted to share the good news of MDMA with everyone, though found the four-letter chemical moniker too clinical, so he came up with the more marketable name, Ecstasy, as he felt that the compound put you in touch with God. Prior to discovering the Boston Group and creating his own Texas-based offshoot, Clegg, who had abandoned the seminary at 26, was working in Dallas as a yoga and tennis instructor, marketing his own form of Zen tennis therapy. Initially, Clegg went to California in the early 1980s, hoping to get a hold of Alexander Shulgin, who after resynthesizing the compound in 1967, would be responsible for its introduction to the world of psychotherapy by means of Leo Zeff. Although Clegg was unsuccessful in his efforts to find Dr. Shulgin, he eventually found a formula elsewhere which allowed Clegg and his chemist to begin production. At first, Clegg simply handed out the drug to friends and people he knew for free, giving the substance away at parties held in his Dallas condo. The first batches came from Clegg's California lab, but in 1983, the group began to mass-produce the drug in a Texas lab also. Customers could call a toll-free 800 number and place their orders for ecstasy over the phone with a credit card. The MDMA tablets were sold in brown bottles under the name Sassafras. Clegg invited friends and associates to his home, psychiatrists, former students of his yoga classes, and tennis students, coaching them through the experience. The partygoers would relax in Clegg's jacuzzi and often loosened up so much that guests would remove their clothes. In 1984, Clegg's California lab was producing a million pills a month and were still unable to meet demand. The pills would come hot off the pill press and were shipped out immediately via UPS or FedEx, with the packages often going out to clubs and psychologists' offices, as well as the mailboxes of ordinary, average, middle-class Americans who had heard about ecstasy through word of mouth. Clegg's business was a multi-million dollar operation, with cash flowing in so quick, Clegg would stuff it in his suitcases, which he shoved in his garage rafters. Clegg bought a jet that he piloted flying shipments of cash to depositories in Switzerland. On May 12, 1984, a new nightclub opened at 703 McKinney in Dallas, called The Stark, named after its designer, Philippe Stark. The club was the brainchild of co-owner Blake Woodall, French designer Philippe Stark, and seamstress Christina de la Mer. When the club had its grand opening, the entry price was a steep $125, Though, once inside, patrons could enjoy live performances by Grace Jones and Stevie Nicks, the latter being an investor for the club herself. At this time, Michael Clegg's Texas group was flooding the Dallas underground with his ecstasy tablets, supplying various nightclubs and bars throughout Dallas. The Stark, which postured itself as Dallas's premier nightclub, would fall victim to Clegg's ecstasy just the same. Ecstasy showed up at the Stark almost immediately after opening, being flooded with ecstasy just one month in, and soon became the central hub for ecstasy in Dallas. Staff began supplying patrons with the drug, with bartenders selling the ecstasy tablets from their register where they kept them in the quarter slots. 
At each night's close, managers would discover $200 tabs with $800 tips, so the club's management were aware of the side hustle, but did little to stop it. The proliferation of MDMA via the Star Club and Clegg's Texas Group would continue for a little while, although its notoriety in Dallas soon grabbed the attention of the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency. Clegg's Texas Group had outgrown their original Seoul, California lab and opened a second ecstasy lab in Texas, starting in 1983. As Clegg's ecstasy continued to spread throughout the clubs, fraternities, college parties, and even in high schools, concerned parents made calls to the Dallas Police Department, inquiring about the new explosive party drug making its way among the Dallas youth scenes. In February 1985, Phil Jordan was reassigned to take control of the DEA's Dallas office, coming from El Paso, with experience tracking the cartel's drug networks in Guadalajara and Juarez. But coming into Dallas, Jordan's number one focus was the new drug, Ecstasy, popular with the kids. Jordan initially just caught club kids selling the drug and had no real lead on the distribution network, but he soon deduced that it was coming from somewhere outside of Texas, placing the source as California. He notified the Los Angeles DEA office, but nothing further came of it. With ecstasy catching the attention of the DEA, Michael Clegg needed an exit strategy. Clegg purchased an old pharmaceutical company in Brazil and converted it into a giant ecstasy lab. He was able to secure himself a large supply of saffron oil, which was stored in 15 55-gallon drums, enough to produce his product indefinitely. From his new base of operations in Brazil, Clegg produced his ecstasy, exporting it to the European market, with Clegg's popular product flooding Ibiza, England, Germany, and the Netherlands. By the time the DEA had made ecstasy illegal, Clegg had shut down his lab in California and managed to relocate to the Cayman Islands, purchasing a yacht and sailing through the Panama Canal up the coast of Central America to Costa Rica, where he bought some land on top of a mountain, successfully evading the clutches of the DEA. In October 1984, Congress passed an amendment to the Controlled Substances Act that gave the DEA the power to emergency schedule chemicals on short notice, reclassifying MDMA as Schedule I. In May 1985, Texas Senator Lloyd Benston asked the acting administrator of the DEA for an emergency ban on MDMA. Citing a study that linked MDA a related psychedelic amphetamine like MDMA with brain damage in rodents, the DEA announced that MDMA would become illegal to sell or possess in a May 31, 1985 announcement, taking effect on July 1st of that year. The first ecstasy bust was at the Stark on July 9th, 1985. After the ban and the end of Clegg's Texas Group, and the affiliated northern distributor, the Boston Group, a small-time dealer named Saxon Hatchet decided to fill the ecstasy production vacuum, setting up an ecstasy lab of his own. Hatchet would recruit a graduate student in organic chemistry from the University of Texas, building one of the largest ecstasy production operations in the history of the state over the next four years. At the peak of Hatchet's production, he was moving 50,000 pills a month. Hatchet bought a new condo, car, and took ski trips in Aspen, even hanging out with members of New Order, who liked to spend time at Lake Travis outside Austin. Eventually, it became difficult to get a hold of the chemical precursors and the necessary ingredients and materials to make MDMA, as the DEA cracked down and made the starting chemicals illegal in an effort to curb production. Saffron oil, the essential oil of sassafras, the plant precursor to MDA and MDMA, became restricted and watched heavily by the DEA. But demand for the product was still high as ever, so Hatchet outsourced production to Mexico, where he had to deal with the Mexican armed drug traffickers, causing Hatchet to decide to get out of the game. In 1989, before Hatchet could quit the business, a cash drop with some cocaine dealers in Houston went awry. The deal was for 120,000 pills in exchange for half a million in cash, 
but the dealer's runner took it all. Hatchet chalked it up as a loss, but moved on. However, his two business partners insisted they get their money back. Increased contact with the dealers put Hatchet's group on the DEA's radar. In April 1989, Hatchet was arrested and ended up serving seven years in jail. In the spring of 1985, a young 25-year-old Dallas woman named Amy Ralston has her first experience with ecstasy at a North Dallas nightclub called Papagayo, a laser-lit meat market. At the club, Ralston was eventually approached by an older gentleman named Charles Sandy Pofel, who asked her to dance. Pofel was a 43-year-old Dallas businessman who had also discovered ecstasy, and similarly to Clegg, he was so moved by the compound that he decided to get into the ecstasy business himself, soon becoming one of the biggest ecstasy dealers in U.S. history. Ralston and Pofel made a real connection that would last for the next 15 years. Ralston would make her way through the Dallas underground ecstasy scene in the mid-1980s with Pofel, ending up alongside him at the center of a complex international drug smuggling operation. The operation was controlled by Pofel and a Dallas area chemist named Dr. Morris Key, with the illicit ecstasy making operation eventually being known by the name picked by Pofel, Ecstasy International Export and Import Organization, or the EIEIO for short. At the organization's height, peaking around 1989 or so, the EIEIO's reach spanned from Dallas to Guatemala to Germany, selling millions of dollars worth of ecstasy until an international incident in Libya resulted in Pofol and his EIEIO operation becoming discovered by U.S. authorities. Up until then, the group had successfully gone undetected since the mid-80s. Initially, the group seems to have been active in distribution networks within the U.S., but they soon started shipping to other countries in Latin America like Guatemala, before reaching the European market, showing up in countries like Germany around 1987. Worried about the threat of getting caught by authorities, Pofel wanted to move the operation to Amsterdam, but it was an idea that his business partner, Morris Key, shut down. They eventually settled on moving to Imhausen instead, as this was the location where more sourced the saffron and chemical precursors from. They set up successful ecstasy networks in Amsterdam and the United Kingdom around this time. On October 31, 1988, Pofel moved to the Netherlands, bringing 1.3 million ecstasy tablets with him. After an incident in Libya tipped the DEA off to Pofel's operation, they began a campaign to bring him down. In 1989, the operation was busted by the German National Police. Company officials were questioned by authorities, and they soon began handing over documents related to their transactions and production records. Still, authorities had their sights set on Pofel, who was still at large. Some of the group's apprehended members caved under interrogation and informed police that Pofel was scheduled to visit in two weeks from then. On October 16, 1989, Pofel was arrested by German police and charged with violating Germany's Narcotics Act. In the States, U.S. authorities caught Morris Key, the chemist responsible for flooding Western Europe with ecstasy, and he soon was extradited to Germany. In Germany, authorities looked into Pofel's accounts, finding detailed records of the ecstasy business that were meticulously documented by Pofel. While in custody, Pofel told German authorities the names of as many of his collaborators as he possibly could, resulting in numerous arrests in Amsterdam. Dutch authorities raided the floral shop in Amsterdam where Pofel would deliver his product, which would then be sent out to the local coffee houses. The successful operation was hailed as the single largest ecstasy bust in the Netherlands at the time. Assistant U.S. Attorney Charlie Strauss of San Antonio was able to get Pofel and Morris Key to return to the States, where they sought to convict the duo for conspiracy to manufacture MDMA. Now in custody in the U.S., Pofel and Key would eventually start cooperating with U.S. law enforcement. Morris Key would agree to sign a four-page affidavit that detailed his involvement in the operation. 
Pofel would also provide an outline for authorities in Germany, where he laid out all the details of their ecstasy manufacturing organization. For authorities in the U.S., Pofel told them the location of his security boxes in Dallas, where Pofel kept ecstasy tablets as well as hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash. In November 1990, Pofel and Key's trial began in a German criminal court, with proceedings going on for 10 days. Both men were found guilty of the crime of manufacturing MDMA and violating German federal law. Pofel wrote a letter to his wife, Amy Ralston, warning her to stay away from the vault, but it was too late. Ralston's ex-boyfriend retrieved the pills and sold them for more than $300,000, which he gave to Ralston. Ralston threw the $300,000 in the trunk of a rental car, along with an overnight bag with broken ecstasy tablets, driving with it out of Los Angeles on May 5, 1989. U.S. investigators searched Ralston's house and questioned her about her husband previously, but Ralston, unlike Dr. Key's wife, refused to cooperate. Ralston continued to sell and deal, and pretty soon the IRS got a hold of her. Agents realized Ralston was hiding Pofel's assets and believed she was attempting to continue his business. Pofel gave up the names of some of his co-conspirators who were questioned. One dealer admitted he sold 127,000 tablets in early 1989 on Pofel's behalf. Since Pofel was in jail, he met with Ralston instead and gave her the $218,930 from the sale of the tablets. In 1990, investigators searched Ralston's home two more times, freezing her assets and interviewing her L.A. contact. Ralston ran, spending $500 to buy a new identity from a man who operated out of a one-room office behind a Mail Boxes R Us store in Sherman Oaks, California. Ralston took on the name Alex Russell with a new driver's license, birth certificate, and social security number, moving to Florida. But eventually, when Ralston returned to L.A. to see friends and family, she was arrested on March 26, 1991. Ralston was transported to Waco, where she was one of 16 defendants, along with Pofel and Key, in what prosecutors called the biggest ecstasy distribution case in the country's history. Ralston, unlike the others who pled guilty, asked for a trial by jury. The jury found Ralston guilty of money laundering and conspiracy to import and distribute ecstasy. She was given a mandatory minimum sentence of 24 years in prison, the longest sentence of any of her co-defendants. Ralston remained in prison while her husband, Pofel, was released in 1994. In 1999, Ralston attempted to have her conviction overturned. Her sentence would be commuted by Bill Clinton on July 7, 2000. Hobart Hewson III was born on January 12, 1968, to famed Texas historian and author Hobart Hewson Jr. Hewson founded the Science Alliance, a chemical supply business in Humble, Texas, sometime in 1994, with business partner Darren Harlow. In 1996, Hewson was found guilty of conspiracy to manufacture MDA and possessing the controlled precursor isosafrol. In prison, Hewson wrote Total Synthesis, the first book on how to manufacture MDA, MDMA, and other psychedelic amphetamines. The following year, in 1997, ostensibly while on probation, Hewson publishes Total Synthesis through a book publishing house he set up in San Antonio called Panda Inc., and using the pseudonym Strike. 1997 would also see Strike creating an internet website known as The Hive on August 8, 1997. The Hive was an online message board community consisting of mostly clandestine drug chemists discussing the syntheses of various illicit substances and trading techniques. The website was responsible for creating the phrase swim, someone who isn't me, to create plausible deniability from any legal repercussions. The site's members, known as Bees, listed as a mere 69 during its first year, but by the year 2000, the site had 2,500 active users. Strike, acting as the site's webmaster and moderator, would recommend his Total Synthesis and Total Synthesis 2, the book's 1999 second edition, as well as his book Sources, 
while suggesting bees order their chemicals from the Science Alliance for a no-fuss and discreet sale, with the users none the wiser that its owner, Hewson, was none other than Strike himself. Profits from the Science Alliance brought Hobart $450,000 a year. Strike's books, Total Synthesis 1, 2, and Sources, which retailed for around $30 upon release, made Strike into an underground ecstasy folk hero. MDMA was favored above all other drugs by Strike, with the chemist stating that it was the most benign drug he had ever encountered. Strike's online bio in his About page explained that he was an ecstasy and amphetamine chemist from Texas that used to be very frustrated by the lack of basic chemical information about ecstasy and other psychedelic amphetamines. Moderating the hive for the better part of three years, providing help and wisdom every now and then to the users via his posts, Strike claimed that he was retiring as the site's moderator in February 2000 claiming that he was dedicating his time to above-board assaults on the drug war. In 2000, Hewson's The Science Alliance Company grossed $450,000, with a profit margin of $100,000, a $50,000 salary for both Hewson and Harlow. The pair shipped 15 orders a day, many of them being from Hive members. Strike's books grossed $15,000 per year. Unfortunately, in 2001, Strike would come out of retirement, making an appearance on television when he was unmasked by Dateline NBC, who were there at the Science Alliance warehouse under the pretext of interviewing Hobart Hewson, whose company was involved in some legal controversy involving an ecstasy ring bust in Arizona. Dateline conducted a 10-month investigation into the Hive and its users, who were among those involved in the Flagstaff Arizona ecstasy operation, consisting of college students who used the Science Alliance to buy chemicals needed to manufacture ecstasy, turning to the Hive and Total Synthesis to discover how. Leading up to the Flagstaff bust, the students filmed a glassware and saffron purchase from another Hive member known as Spitball. In 2000, Spitball was arrested for MDMA and meth manufacture. Now, he would earn himself another sentence in the Flagstaff case, getting eight years for his part. A total of three Hive users were identified in the students' tapes, obtained by Dateline. The Northern Arizona University students pretended to be a small legitimate company, G3 Custom Fabrication, a resin company, to order from the Science Alliance. Some of the chemicals in their order to the Science Alliance included 500 grams of copper chloride, 500 grams of sodium borohydride, 1 kilogram of benzoquinone, 4 liters of NN dimethylformamide, and 10 kilograms of ammonium acetate. Acting on a tip, authorities raided the student's apartment at 6 a.m. on the morning of June 22, 2000, finding a camcorder with around six hours of incriminating footage, along with $200,000 in equipment and chemicals, with a copy of Strike's Total Synthesis II in their home lab. Five of the students were arrested and charged with felonies. Jennifer Levi and Rick Kim were charged with selling ecstasy. Chemistry students Robbie Gordon, Jeffrey Gilgem, and Jonathan Garber were charged with conspiracy to manufacture ecstasy. Two months after his Dateline interview with John Larson, Hewson was arrested and charged with manufacturing ecstasy in the Flagstaff case for providing chemicals and instruction along with a charge for operating an illegal enterprise, which includes racketeering and money laundering. After his initial arrest and conviction on June 22, 2000, Hobart was then charged with an ecstasy lab case in California, which police claimed was one of the biggest in the nation. In Operation Triple X during October 2001, the FBI busted a 20-person ecstasy ring in Escondido, California, who had purchased chemicals from Houston. Houston's Science Alliance products were found in clandestine labs from Oregon to Atlanta. Houston was interviewed by police in May, where he was critical of the drug war and defended his ecstasy activism, as well as the drug's safety and benefits. A detective asked Hewson if it bothered him that his books were used to teach how to make ecstasy. Hewson replied, No, if you tried ecstasy, then you'd know why I did it. In November 2001, 
Houston was one of 24 charged in the California bust of an ecstasy lab hidden inside an internet pornography business in an office park in Escondido, California. The lab was run by Thomas Lilas, a 33-year-old ecstasy chemist from Stockholm, Sweden. Houston's attorney, Gus Saper from Houston, stated the Science Alliance was a legitimate company and the books were merely for informational purposes, arguing that the book warns of the dangers of making ecstasy. Saper argued that his client just took all the available information which was already out there and compiled it into one place. Houston pleaded innocent and was free on $50,000 bail for the Arizona case but then was taken into custody in San Diego for the California case. Houston was convicted in 2003. In September 2003, he started an eight-year term at the Federal Correctional Institution in Bastrop, Texas. Hobart Houston was released from prison on June 20, 2009. Ross William Ulbrit, better known as Dread Pirate Roberts, was born on March 27, 1984, in Austin, Texas. Ross was a Boy Scout in his youth, attaining the rank of Eagle Scout. He attended Westridge Middle School and Westlake High School near Austin, graduating in 2002. He attended the University of Texas at Dallas on a scholarship, graduating with a bachelor's degree in physics in 2006. He began a master's degree program at Pennsylvania State University in materials science and engineering, specializing in crystallography. He began to become interested in libertarian economic theory and student political debates. He graduated Penn State in 2009 and returned to Austin. He tried day trading and making a video game company, but failed in both. He partnered with friend Donnie Palmtree to build an online bookstore, Good Wagon Books. Palmtree moved to Dallas and left the bookstore to Ross. At this time, Ross had already been planning Silk Road, wanting to use economic theory as a means to abolish the use of coercion and aggression amongst mankind. Silk Road, a dark web drug market on tour, would allow users to anonymously buy and sell drugs using Bitcoin. The IRS and DEA got him in 2013. On May 29, 2015, he was sentenced to a double life imprisonment, plus 40 years without parole.